So we're on to chapter 8 of Beyond Good and Evil, entitled Peoples and Fatherlands. And this is the penultimate section, which is a bit hard to believe, because even though we've been moving at a fairly quick pace, given the ambitious nature of the project we've set for ourselves with this analysis, nevertheless, it's been a very long time. <laughs> we've been on this for months now, and so we're actually finally coming to the end. Now, as to what Nietzsche is doing in this section, uh, I will give a brief overview, as I have with many of these other chapters. Peoples and fatherlands might seem strange uh, for a topic for Nietzsche to focus on in the latter part of this work, especially given that isn't that sort of an equation of unequal things? You know, I could see somebody, especially those who sort of see a lot of parallels between, say, Nietzsche and Max uh, Stirner you know, would sort of emphasize the fact that Nietzsche sees every phenomenon, every quanta of force or power, you might say, every pattern of existence as fundamentally a different phenomenon, something individual um, or something peculiar, we might say, that is merely grouped together in categories which are we might say, manifestations or consequences of a given perspective rather than any sort of objective grouping or classification. All of that is perhaps just a long-winded way of saying that, you know, nations and peoples could be regarded from such a perspective as what uh, is often translated in English, what Max Stirner would call a spook, right? It's just a, it's a phantom, a phantasm, of uh, our intellect or our perspective. It's something that we're uh, bringing to bear with our perspective upon the world. It's not something that exists within the world itself. So why is Nietzsche concerned with this? Well, it, it harkens back to the some of the things that he said in parts one and two of Beyond Good and Evil about the way that a people is shaped by their geography. So notice he doesn't just say, I'm going to talk about uh, you know, he doesn't give it a broad title, like, I'm just going to talk about civilizations. He's talking about a people which is a thing shaped by a country, a fatherland. And even though the sort of patriotic meaning of the terms like fatherland and motherland probably seem a bit archaic to us now, it is apropos that uh, Nietzsche would think of a country that way as something that begets a people or gives birth to a people insofar as the comments he's made earlier in Beyond Good and Evil are that things like climate, geography, these very physical, real, concrete things that uh, premise the survival of a given people, the, the way that the environment around you requires you to adapt to it and then consequently to value certain things over others to regard certain character traits or skill sets or situations or uh, any number of things as more valuable than others because of the way that you and everyone around you realized that that was in many, you know, in some examples, a premise of your survival. And this is very easy to see with people who live in very extreme geographical conditions, you know, thinking of, of course, you know, Inuits or Bedouins, people who live in extreme cold or extreme heat, in environments that are very desolate, which then require you to cultivate a very particular set of skills and traits, so we might say to value a very particular set of things. And so with all that in mind, even though Nietzsche is very individualistic, he recognizes the way in which a people is something created out of, um, as a living process, right? As an evolutionary process, something created, created out of the pressures and the demands that were made upon them, whatever was found necessary for the flourishing of life in a given environment. And life is something that Nietzsche has attempted throughout this work to establish as a new basis of valuing to understand that every set of valuations, the, the very uh, theory of the case that we just finished outlining, right? That the very set of valuations that a people makes are driven by 
this principle of life that whatever made them to flourish, they grew to value, and whatever they found harmful or detrimental to life, they would eschew. And as such, to then see this principle of life or health, um, Nietzsche would say that to give those terms actual content so that it's not just metaphor or poetic language, he would say the actual content is will to power, but that this principle of life um, may be stated a little more broadly so that we can maybe sort of understand the thrust of this whole chapter a bit more broadly. That principle is what, uh, it's the meta principle from which all of our other moral principles flow forth. And that just as the conditions that affect and shape and beget a group of people, or for that matter, an individual person, and you could apply this to the entire human race, right? You could even say there are certain universal factors that premise the survival or the, the flourishing of all human beings, and that that's something approximating what we call the human condition. But that every single one of those, whatever level we want to look at, that is something becoming. It's not, you could say it's, I, I hesitate to say that it's not an objective fact of existence, right? Because you could say there's nothing more objective than the fact that if you don't have enough water in the desert, you will uh, die of dehydration, right? You'll die very quickly. You could say that's like the closest thing to an objective fact, quote unquote, that there is. But when Nietzsche attacks the idea of a an objective mind independent human independent truth, he's not um, trying to challenge such a notion that you, you won't you won't get dehydrated if you don't have water in the desert. That that's just your opinion, man. That's not what Nietzsche's saying at all. He's trying to take us out of this Platonic mindset of eternalizing what we know to be true, based on our vantage point as something that has evolved as a living thing and therefore a moving thing, something part of a moving, ever-changing process called life, and that all of the apparent stability or duration that we perceive is only a temporary reality. Um, it's, a, it's something that is a reality for us. Maybe we could even say a reality for us as the entire human race when it comes to certain propositions, right? But that mankind itself is something that became, that once was not was, and at a future time will no longer be, preferably because it has become something else, and preferably because it has become something better than what has come before. And as to what better means, we look back to that very principle of life, right, of will to power. But so to, to sort of sum up all of this then, that's the perspective with which Nietzsche can have a concept of what a people is. It's not something with like a Hegelian spirit, right? A sort of geist or essence to it. It is a certain pattern of life, a certain phenomenon that is manifest in very physical, concrete terms. And to the extent that there is a sort of spirit or uh, what might we say sort of self-conception of a people's identity what it's premised on are these valuations which are first and foremost physiological and spring from an unconscious non-rational place the rational and the conscious the moral realm is an elaboration upon what already exists at the point of valuing and so it's from that perspective that Nietzsche is now going to make a number of comments about, for example, the Germans. And that's what he's talking about, is the Germans as a people, a group that was bound together by certain mutual premises or a certain way of life, right? Uh, physiological demands for the continuation or preservation of a certain way of life. And as we've discussed Throughout season three in the politics uh, season, whenever you have such a people like form a polity or a civilization, just as an individual human being has a lifespan, uh, nations and empires seem to have some sort of lifespan. The social bonds, even though they may be invisible to us, are very real and their dissolution can adversely affect all of society. 
those very social bonds do seem to be based upon that idea of the shared valuation. And so the result of this is that when Nietzsche says in 240, and we'll get into the text now, quote, I heard once again for the first time Richard Wagner's overture to the Meistersinger. It is magnificent, overcharged, heavy, late art that has the pride of presupposing two centuries of music is still living, if it is to be understood. It is to the credit of the Germans that such pride did not miscalculate. End quote. So the Meistersinger, that's one of Nietzsche's uh, favorite compositions, when he's, especially when he's younger, um, you know, sort of when he's spending time with the Wagners and when Richard Wagner is considered his friend and something of a mentor to Nietzsche. But here he seems to have mixed words for it. It's magnificent, but it's also overcharged and heavy, which um, excessive, right, is what we can say. But the most key phrase is it's late art. What is late art? I mean, we might think about the Alexandrian period of ancient Greece, which is what Nietzsche talks about in Birth of Tragedy, the work that he wrote while he was chumming around with the Wagners, that uh, the Alexandrian is sort of considered, and it's way more complicated than this, but you have to listen to all of the Birth of Tragedy analysis if you really want to understand these concepts. But just to sort of give the simplest explanation I can and to call it to mind, the Alexandrian's like the Apollinian with no Dionysian, but since the Apollinian and the Dionysian in some ways presuppose each other, because these are specific artistic manifestations of a certain impulse towards either individuation or dissolution. And without both, you don't have art, if uh, that makes sense, which it probably doesn't without the context of that work. But anyway, uh, so the it's more proper to say the Alexandrian is pure individuation. Uh, that pure conceptual, rational, discursive, cognitive, dividing line drawing uh, approach to the world. And consequently, if we look at the periods of ancient Greece, you could sort of associate the Dionysian period with the archaic. It's the time of the you know, Dionysian mystery cults and the worship of Pan and so on and so forth. And then the Hellenic period as what Nietzsche would see as the period of the Apollinian and the Dionysian coming into awareness of one another and basically coming into being through one another. So that's the tragic period of ancient Greece. And then the Alexandrian is a later period of ancient Greece. And I had uh, this professor describe this to me. He wrote me an email to sort of explain some things, um, mainly about the way I was using certain terms. But you, you can hear that uh, email. I read it off in the uh, uh, Christmas episode last year. In any case, uh, you know, the Alexandrian period is a period that was defined by self-referential and meta approaches to art and literature. And we probably are all familiar with this because it resembles the age that we're in, right? That the Alexandrian period was a period where they already had all, you know, centuries of technique and movements and all of the different arts. And now they're more, you know, the, the major works of that period are like encyclopedia-esque uh, ventures into literature and the arts, categorizing and uh, things and trying to look back and understand and make sense of all everything that came before. And all of the art can sort of like deconstruct and riff on previous, um, you know, uh, memes and tropes, if you will because everyone knew them and like all of the really famous things that they were referencing were written or had, you know, there were works of art and literature from previous ages. And then now the depictions are all sort of referential to the things that came before. There's none of that Dionysian creative spark, right? That breaks down boundaries and, and gets rid of that sort of need for self-conception and identifiers and classification and category. Uh, you know, there's none of that Dionysian energy. And so this passage that we just barely read a sentence of uh, requires so much background to really understand it that much of what's going on here is that Nietzsche is not just describing how he feels about the Meistersinger, he's describing how he feels about Wagner himself. Uh, you know, you can't separate the art from the artist in spite of what the common turn of phrase might tell us all. And that Wagner, um, you know, he is a late artist. 
He is an artist of the later period of a people when that vitality, that strength, that inner life is, we might say, in decline. It doesn't have that Dionysian energy anymore. It's not generating anew. It's sort of drawing upon what came before. But Nietzsche says, I mean, there is something magnificent about the work, and it has the pride of presupposing two centuries of music as still living, if it is to be understood. So in order to get it, you have to be, you know, the audience has to be familiar with two centuries of German music. And Nietzsche says that it's to the credit of the Germans that the pride of Wagner, the pride of saying, he's saying Nietzsche was like, look at this magnificent pride of somebody to say, well, if you really want to understand my work, you need to know two centuries. Of, you have to do two centuries of preparatory reading or listening to understand it. And the it's to his credit that he was not wrong. The Germans, they live within <laughs> this uh, past, as Nietzsche will say. He'll say this explicitly toward the end of this passage. But that the Germans are, uh, in some sense, you could say the Germans are like standing at the end of a long, fruitful period of artistic genius and productivity, where if you look at, you know, think of all the famous classical composers and then how many of those names are German? Well, that's all well before this period where Nietzsche is writing and that Wagner is composing and Wagner arrives late. He's one of the late comers. And as a result, Wagner has the advantage that we sort of discussed earlier that anyone in a quote age of comparisons has where they can draw upon this much wider artistic palette because they didn't have to forge <laughs> their particular artistic movement or technique or whatever it might be uh, out of raw material. They have forerunners. And so with that in mind, let's. Uh, I'm going to read the rest of this passage now uh, because I think a lot of it will come through very clearly with all the background context explained. So we'll continue. Quote, what flavors and forces, what seasons and climes are not mixed here? It strikes us now as archaic, now as strange, tart, and too young. It is just as capricious as it is pompous traditional. It is not infrequently saucy, still more often coarse and rude. It has fire and courage, and at the same time, the loose done skin of a fruit that ripens too late. It flows broad and full, and suddenly a moment of inexplicable hesitation, like a gap opening up between cause and effect, a, pr a pressure triggering dreams, almost nightmares, but al already the old width and breadth are regained by the current of well-being, the most manifold well-being of old and new happiness, very much including the artist's happiness with himself, which he has no wish to hide. Uh, end quote. I'm going to skip a little further down in the passage. Quote, Altogether, no beauty, no south, nothing of southern and subtle brightness of the sky, nothing of gracefulness, no dance, scarcely any will to logic, even a certain clumsiness that is actually stressed, as if the artist, artist wished to say to us, that is part of my intention. Cumbersome drapery, something capricious, barbarian, and solemn, a flurry of erudite preciousness and lace, something German in the best and worst senses of the word, something manifold, formless, and inexhaustible in a German way, a certain German powerfulness and overfulness of the soul, which is not afraid of hiding behind refinements of decay, which perhaps really feels most at home there, a truly genuine token of the German soul, which is at the same time young and superannuated, overly mellow and still over-rich in future. The kind of music, ex excuse me, this kind of music expresses best what I think of the Germans. They belong to the day before yesterday and the day after tomorrow. As yet, they have no today, end quote. So there is um, something therefore very important in Nietzsche's analysis of the Meistersinger, and as I've suggested, insofar as he's analyzing his sort of the, it's very wonderful the way Nietzsche takes on talking about this work of music because it's, it's all emotional, poetic language about how it makes you feel listening to the Meistersinger, such that, uh, you know, I think Nietzsche would actually have been a very good, uh, critic. Now, that's the reason why he would have, because Nietzsche is an artist himself, right, in terms of his lyrical uh, prose poems of so, some people have described his writing as a form of art. 
And uh, that's why his talents would have been wasted being a critic. And that's why uh, critics are generally uh, very terrible at evaluating art because <laughs> you'd have to be an artist to be a true critic of art. Um, because it's not about, you know, um, you know, analyzing like <laughs> what polyrhythmic, uh, you know, technique was used in this measure of the song or something of that nature. You know, it's nothing logical. It's what's important is this, uh, sort of experience the artist is conveying. And, um, I don't know, I guess all of that's sort of an aside. I think what's important is that, especially in the second half of that, uh, this first aphorism of part eight, Nietzsche explicitly ties that analysis of Wagner and the Meister Singer to the Germans. He makes him an epitome and, and in such a way that it's almost a little bit, we might say, you could call it a contradiction to say that he's a genuine token of the German soul, because isn't that sort of uh, imputing an essence to the German people? But I, I think we can give Nietzsche a bit of poetic license there because he's not he, he's not sketching out some sort of platonic idea of what the Germans are, some sort of essence that defines Germanness, uh, which is like the completely backwards platonic way of thinking. The Germans are something that have become. They are, uh, in a way, you can't even understand what he's saying unless you understand them as a living dynamic historical phenomenon just as all peoples are and because they are latecomers or they're they are at a late stage in their culture in their artistic productions in their way of approaching life and understanding life and now uh, Wagner also was you know he used the term the music of the future that was associated with Wagner's compositions well here Nietzsche says the German belongs to the day before yesterday and the day after tomorrow. What was Wagner doing? He was drawing upon the myths and folklore of the Germans that hearkened from a pre-Christian age, and uh, at least at one time, Nietzsche's perception of what he was doing was to sort of reach into the distant past in order to find some way of navigating into the uh, future of their society or their culture. And while it would be accurate to say that Nietzsche himself is concerned with the future, I mean, be, even in his later career, when he's well beyond Wagner, this book is, I don't think I've actually said it uh, before we started this reading um, way back in part one, but the subtitle of Beyond Good and Evil is Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future. Um, there is, he's talking about the philosophers of the future. He's writing this whole book to people that are going to come after him. But in some sense, the the future ideal that Nietzsche is hoping for will is in some sense represented by someone who is able to be more in the present. Um, and I, I mean, this can be vulgarized and like oversimplified to the just live in the moment type ideology, but there is a great deal in Nietzsche's writing about forgetfulness, which we're going to cover at the beginning of next season. And there is a sense in which, the conscious world that we live in as human beings necessarily predisposes us to live historically, to be constantly aware of ourselves as a creature which is dragging a past and which is being dragged into the future. And that there is some sense in which being able to forget about that and, um, to completely immerse oneself in the immediate sensation and stimulus of their immediate experience is liberatory for Nietzsche. And so perhaps that is the big problem with the Germans is that they have no sense for living in the present. And so with this very long explanation of the very first uh, aphorism, I think we can move on to 241. Quote, we good Europeans, we too know ours when we permit ourselves some hearty fatherlandishness, a plop and relapse into old loves and narrownesses. I have just given a sample of that. Hours of national agitations, patriotic palpitations, and various other sorts of archaizing sentimental inundations. More ponderous spirits than we are may require more time to get over what with us takes only hours, and in a few hours has run its course. Some require half a year, 
others half a life, depending on the speed and power of their, their digestion and metabolism. Indeed, I could imagine dull and sluggish races who would require half a century even in our rapidly moving Europe to overcome such atavistic attacks of fatherlandishness and soil addiction and to return to reason, meaning good Europeanism. End quote. And so we've discussed this in past sections already, but just as a brief recap, the idea of the good European is Nietzsche's notion that individual national ethnic regional commitments in Europe are going to vanish over time. Europe is going to all these like sort of bickering dynastic interests are going to be subsumed within one European political order. And that when this happens, this will lead to sort of a great mixing of all the different European ethnicities into one new European person. And politically, this is largely what has happened. And likely speaking, if we go, if we were to advance, uh, turn the clock a few centuries into the future, I think we would see that process that Nietzsche described uh, well underway. But if we recall, um, Nietzsche thinks that not only is this process inevitable, as he said in past sections, but that um, because it is inevitable, the only real question then is what this new European will become. So by the idea of the good European, Nietzsche is, we, we might consider this in contrast to the bad European, the possibility that this great mixing together of all of the cultural content of Europe, um, you know, uh, produces something ugly or terrible. And uh, that's entirely possible, right? I mean, if you've ever tried uh, uh, cooking, this highly advanced science that many of us try their, their hand at, uh, you know that just throwing all the spices, every single spice in your spice rack together into a stew is not guaranteed to make a good stew. But um, if you're a really skilled uh, chef, you might be able to combine all sorts of different flavors and still produce something that's delicious, right? It's just a matter of technique and it's a delicate uh, balancing act, right? And so maybe enough of my metaphors here, although I think it, it works because Nietzsche is talking about digestion and metabolism. Uh, always notice how he returns to the physiological and how it's that's not just a metaphor, that he really does think getting over these what does he say? National agitations, patriotic palpitations, uh, sentimental uh, feelings for one's country. The sense of patriotism and love of country is something that we read, we free spirits, takes us a couple hours to get over. And I think he's exaggerating a bit there um, or understating the case, but... <laughs> You know, we might consider this uh, uh, just a, a statement about Nietzsche's own youth and how quickly he got over those feelings once he was uh, around those kind, you know, the the beer drinking frat brothers that he was exposed to who were hyper patriotic when he was in college uh, showed him what those kind of people were like. And I, I, we can guess that he got over it fairly quickly and uh, recognized that he was not one of those. <laughs> but, you know, it might take others a couple months or years to get over these feelings. But if it, what matters is your pace of metabolism and digestion, how fast you can metabolize and digest these ideas, understand what those feelings are. And if you've been following along with this whole book of Beyond Good and Evil, you, you should be able to grasp rather quickly what Nietzsche would think such patriotic or national sentiments are. These are moral valuations, which are a certain tyrannical impulse impulse, excuse me, from the past, which has been imposed onto the psyche of all the constituent members of a given group by the power of the collective, of the herd, by forcing every individual to become afraid of violating these sets of valuations. And, um, you know, the, that doesn't mean, you know, we, we don't have to be moralists about understanding morality, right? As Nietzsche himself points out. So that's not to say, well, that was all bad that people did that. It was immoral that they <laughs> imposed morality on the community. That's not the point at all. The, the point is to recognize, however, that these are contingent. They're historical phenomena, these peoples and fatherlands. And um, as a free spirit, it's a bit 
ridiculous or absurd once you've metabolized that information to still hold that sort of patriotic sentimentality, even though Nietzsche says we might allow ourselves a relapse into it from time to time. He understands the appeal there, we might say, the draw, the pull, because that is one way that people find meaning or find an ideal in their lives is to gravitate towards a certain national character or you know, ethnic identity or something like that. But he calls this atavistic. Again, is that good or bad? Atavism is a, is a throwback. It's a regression to something from nature that's no longer around. Is that good or bad? We need to get over these, this kind of dichotomous thinking, right? Because Nietzsche has used the term atavism in other sections of his work to refer to figures like Napoleon. Napoleon's also a throwback to a more natural approach or way of life. He has nothing but good things to say about Napoleon, right? Um, and then here he's saying the return to reason is good Europeanism. And so, in a sense, you know, again, that could throw you for a loop if you're, you know, thinking about the ways in which Nietzsche is very critical of reason and has a positive view towards atavistic attitudes. I personally think that would be losing the plot or losing the forest for the trees, because I think it's very clear given his past comments on what the good European represents to Nietzsche is that the inevitability of a common European identity subsuming or enveloping, or basically we could say destroying all of the old individual European identities is not something that Nietzsche thinks is an option. Uh, and so when he's saying, uh, you know, to get rid of this atavistic attacks of fatherlandishness and soil addiction, the sense of, of I'm tied to this certain place. I am, uh, I mean, that that's like the, the proto sort of, uh, the Volkish movement, right? The proto Nazis had that saying, uh, blood and soil, which Nietzsche is directly calling out here basically as something which the free spirit has to get over this identification with their blood, with with their people and their fatherland. That's basically what that saying means, right? Of this self-identification with these, um, what might we say, contingent uh, traits or aspects of yourself that are not what is exceptional about you, but what is common about you. And in any case, the the free spirit, as he's describing here, the return to reason, as he describes it, is to see the reality of the situation, that the dissolution of all these individual ethnic and national identities, the creation of a new European civilization is happening, and therefore the only question is how to cultivate that such that we create good Europeans and not bad ones, and to go back to the, sort of the recipe analogy that I was using earlier, What's important here is that when you mix different valuations, different ways of life or patterns of being, I mean, in a way, those are almost, they, they sound more descriptive than to just say valuations, but it's more just flowery language because the valuation is what's important. That's the, um, what we might say, the building blocks of a culture or that the points of valuation are the places where culture exists because or the shared points of shared valuation and that at times these could conflict and that's where you're going to have people who are we might say there's a chance that somebody with conflicting valuations will be destroyed or weakened by the state of affairs there's another possibility like with somebody like Goethe they could harness that tension in order to propel them forward to greater things. And so sometimes people get mixed up with this question of, is it better or worse to have, you know, one orthodox set of valuations that everyone agrees to? Or does Nietzsche think that it's better to have this clashing and comparison of different values and virtues by which, uh, you know, you know, this inner tension becomes like the bow of the soul drawn taut. And the point, the answer to that question would be, it depends. For Nietzsche, most uh, individuals are going to gravitate towards the herd, and they're not going to want to have 
this conflicting battle within their soul. They're going to want to be told an easy to understand, uh, ready made set of valuations to follow, right? Uh, they, they want the handed down moral code. They are concerned with whether they're seen as a good person by others as like their primary concern. And so, um, the, those people perhaps do not need to have conflicting values. Whereas somebody like Goethe, who is a very individual person, um, might have been smothered or suffocated by such a society that only valued one thing. Um, so it depends, but that's the very reason why the, the new type of person that the European of the future will be, will have to be actively cultivated. If it's just a passive process, uh, you're liable to find that your Europe is worse off at the end of this, the end of this transformation. And so, um, okay, we'll continue with this uh, passage where Nietzsche claims to have overheard a conversation between uh, two patriots. Uh, he says, as I am digressing to this possibility, it so happens that I have become an ear witness to a conversation between two old patriots. Apparently both were hard of hearing and therefore spoke much louder. And so the, I would uh, class this under things that happened for 500. Um, that's a, a bit of sarcasm for you. I, I think these are very clearly just characters for Nietzsche to sort of put words in their mouths. I'm not going to read this whole fictional exchange, but the two patriots are talking about Bismarck. One of them describes him as, uh, I guess, sort of a buffoon, somebody who doesn't, he knows as much of philosophy as a peasant or a fraternity student but that this is the age of the masses and that uh, he was a statesman who condemned his people to politicking. And uh, although so far they had had better things to do and think about, he made their spirit narrow, he made their taste national. And this first patriot poses the question, what would we think of a statesman who did all of this? Would he be great? And the other patriot says, well, yes, by, by the very virtue of the fact that uh, he was able to do it. He was a great man. But uh, perhaps, uh, he says, it was insane to want such a thing, but perhaps everything great was merely insane when it started, which is actually a, a wonderful turn of phrase from Nietzsche that I'm surprised is not uh, quoted more. And you might say, well, that's not Nietzsche. He's writing this in the mouth of a character. How many times have we heard a one of Nietzsche's characters say something and then it gets just represented as a quotation just from Nietzsche, but I digress. Uh, and this little exchange concludes, quote, an abuse of words, his partner shouted back, strong, strong and insane, not great, uh, end quote. And then Nietzsche has a little uh, sort of conclusion to the section here, quote, the old men had obviously become heated as they thus flung their truths into each other's faces, but I and my happiness and beyond considered how soon one stronger will become master over the strong. Also that for the spiritual flattening of a people, there is a compensation, namely the deepening of another people, end quote. Kaufman believes the deepening of another people is the French, that uh, in response to the spiritual flattening of the Germans, the German turn from pursuit of the arts and music and these accomplishments and culture and the attempt instead to accomplish things in terms of like physical domination, military domination over Europe, that uh, the French have had to become deeper in response to this as the predictable and continual target of the Germans militarily. And another interesting thing that Kaufman says is that without grasping this last sentence, you cannot begin to understand Nietzsche's conception of the will to power or beyond good and evil. And I think... That might be a bit of an overstatement from Kaufman, which is uh, funny because he doesn't normally do that, in my opinion. But uh, I think to the extent that he's right, this passage by implication is Nietzsche giving credit to Bismarck for being a great state statesman just by virtue of the fact that he was even able to sort of reshape the German people and uh, into a political people. To make that the main focus and national pride of the Germans is sort of like Bismarck's greatness, and Nietzsche recognizes this, um, even uh, at the height of Nietzsche's disdain for Bismarck. He's able to write these um, uh, these lines. Uh, you know, even though you might say these 
he overheard this conversation. I don't believe that happened, as I've said before. So perhaps the, the reason why this passage in Kaufman's view is so key to understanding Nietzsche's conception of beyond good and evil is that he is thinking beyond good and evil in this passage. Um, he's not writing this to assign a moral uh, condemnation or praise of Bismarck or of the French or the Germans, for that matter. And with that, we'll move on to 242. Quote, call that in which the distinction of the European is sought civilization or humanization or progress, or call it simply without praise or blame using a political formula, Europe's democratic movement. Behind all the moral and political foregrounds to which such formulas point, a tremendous physiological process is taking place and gaining momentum. The Europeans are becoming more similar to each other. They become more and more detached from the conditions under which races originate that are tied to some climate or class. They become increasingly independent of any determinate milieu that would like to inscribe itself for centuries in body and soul with the same demands, thus an essentially supranational and nomadic type of man is gradually coming up, a type that possesses, physiologically speaking, a maximum of the art and power of adaptation as its typical distinction, end quote. So, uh, given the sort of the background to this section of the work that I outlined at the beginning, I think a lot of this is fairly clear. We have the focus on physiology. This is fundamentally a physiological process in the way that nations or peoples are made. Well, the modern European man simply is not made that way anymore. And notice what he says. He's now supranational, above the national, and nomadic. He's able to wander, you might say, to use a familiar Nietzschean metaphor, between all the various cultures and types of valuations and valuing that have been created so far. Uh, he's no longer subject to the same physical conditions which shape the physiological demands for a certain way of life, which then are elaborated and manifest into moral codes and so on and so forth. Um, he is no longer of a determinate milieu, which means the new European man is as yet indeterminate. And uh, what is the last thing he says? A maximum of the art and power of adaptation as its typical distinction. And notice he ties this to Europe's democratic movement. And he is quick to say without any praise or blame. And I think the most helpful thing for us will be to recall Nietzsche's remarks earlier in the text um, regarding we immoralists and how those of us who are not keen to fix a moral valuation onto everything can then see something like the democratic movement of Europe, which, whatever our opinion of it, Nietzsche's opinion of it, uh, we would say is rather negative, but we can see the result or the process that is driving this movement, the thing that's behind it, as something which Nietzsche might regard rather differently, that the opportunity for a maximally adaptive, nomadic type of soul is the precise forge in which you might create these philosophers of the future that uh, might not have even been thinkable, say, back in the time of the Middle Ages, when all of these ethno-national identities might have been more determinately defined, but where the rigidity of that mindset and that culture didn't permit the kind of uh, exceptions that might now arise. We'll continue with the passage, quote, The tempo of this process of the evolving European may be retarded by great relapses, but perhaps it will gain in vehemence and profundity and grow just on their account. The still raging storm and stress of national feeling belongs here. Also that anarchism, which is just now coming up. But this process will probably lead to results which would seem to be least expected by those who naively promote and praise it, the apostles of modern ideas. The very same new conditions that will, on the average, lead to the leveling and mediocritization of man, to a useful, industrious, handy, multi-purpose herd animal, are likely in the highest degree to give birth to exceptional human beings of the most dangerous and attractive quality. End quote. So, the anarchism which is now coming up, 
and these resurgences of national feeling that Nietzsche has addressed in previous sections. He's broadly speaking about the extremes of the left and the right wing, because the anarchists at this time are largely socialist anarchists. They're the no gods, no masters types of people that Nietzsche was talking about earlier. That's who he's addressing here versus the the old sort of patriots who want to return to this simplicity of the national identity. These are two responses to a seemingly inevitable trend being driven by its own logic that is driving towards this end that Nietzsche sees, which uh, he would say is inevitable. The opposition to it, his point here, uh, is only going to strengthen it, or it, you know, it will perhaps gain in vehemence and profundity and grow just on their account, on the account of the opposition of uh, these attempts to unbend the bow, as Nietzsche uh, puts that turn of phrase in the preface. So this is comparable to the way in which Nietzsche talks about decadence or the decay of a society, that your opposition to it doesn't actually do anything to halt the process. It actually hastens the decline because one of the symptoms of decadence is the very fact that the citizenry and the intelligentsia begin to question and make questionable the authorities that run society. Um, that even this bringing into awareness of the questionability of the authority structure is itself a problem <laughs> uh, in, in its own right. And that the more that you therefore attack the decadence and draw attention to it and draw everyone's attention to it, um, the more you call into question everything about your civilization and culture and only hasten the process. Ironically, this aspect exists in Marxist dialectics as well. I would say that the opposition, you know, because in Hegelian dialectics, you come to understand that opposites don't actually mutually exclude each other or destroy each other. And in many ways, they enhance and bring one another forth. Well, if that's the case, then these forms of opposition to this evolution of the European man are only going to hasten bringing it forward, or they will just be part of the process of bringing it forward. But Nietzsche says the outcome, and this is another interesting aspect, the outcome of this whole what does he say? I mean, he ties it to the democratic movement, but really it's sort of a physiological process going on beneath that. The outcome of this is going to not be what is expected or wanted by the very people who are the apostles of these modern ideas of freedom, equality, and so on. That's not what they're going to get at the end of this process. That the leveling and mediocritization of man is going to serve to basically create that horde of people where all they can do is obey. Uh, this is sort of a idea that Nietzsche sketched out earlier. But in addition to this, it's going to have that other effect of making possible all these exceptional types, types of people. And as Nietzsche said earlier in the text, when you get an atavistic type of person who is does have that talent for commanding and he finds himself surrounded by people who only know how to obey, well, then you have a situation like that of a Napoleon and this is, you know, again, those kinds of trains of thought of Nietzsche that can make people somewhat uncomfortable. But there's a sense in which Nietzsche is just speaking here as a prognosticator or a prophet rather than advocating for anything. He's very careful not to advocate for anything. And it's the complexity of this passage is it's actually very difficult because there are so many aspects that, once again, might be things in other contexts that he would criticize, that he's saying might have an outcome that he might admire. Nevertheless, he's not really, the point in this passage is not to advocate for anything. Well, not yet. He's, he's going to at the end of this passage. So let's, let's get down to it. Uh, let's finish this one out. Quote, to be sure that power of adaptation, which keeps trying out changing conditions and begins some new work with every generation, almost with every decade, does not make possible the powerfulness of the type and the overall impression of such future Europeans will probably be that of manifold garrulous workers who will be poor in will, extremely employable, and as much in need of a master and commander as of their daily bread. But while the democratization of Europe leads to the production of a type that is prepared for slavery in the subtlest sense, in single exceptional cases, the strong human being will have to turn out stronger and richer than perhaps ever before, thanks to the absence of prejudice from his training. 
thanks to the tremendous manifoldness of practice, art, and mask. I meant to say the democratization of Europe is at the same time an involuntary arrangement for the cultivation of tyrants, taking that word in every sense, including the most spiritual. End quote. And so, again, as we get to the end of the passage, Nietzsche does a better job of summing up uh, the main thrust of his point than I ever could, that the democratization of Europe is at the same time an involuntary arrangement for the cultivation of tyrants. And there's so much to say about this. Um, we might just think, though, of his earlier remarks about how in democratic institutions, modern parliamentary organizations, they're designed in such a way so that no one has to feel as though they're in command. Uh, as though the they're simply the first among equals or the administrator over a system or the servant of the people. Uh, that there is, as Nietzsche says in the essay, The Greek State, an advantage that perhaps the tyrants of modernity have insofar as we now have these ideas of the dignity of man and the dignity of labor and that people will cling to these ideas even as they're ground into dust by the system that wants to use them and exploit them for some um, instrumental end, which is what civilization does in general. Um, and so bringing it back to the, the conclusion of the passage and the idea that Nietzsche has put forward throughout this entire book of the way things really are, for, for lack of a better description, right? He's, because he is trying to describe reality as such through will to power at least as an experimental um, proposition, we might say, that the result is a what you might call a tyrannical world. And Nietzsche even says elsewhere in the book that that might be too um, weak of a word to really understand it, but that it all comes down to, on the biological level, stimulus and response, um, cause and effect with no separation between them, the doer and the deed unseparated. The body feels something and it responds. It has a feeling or a drive, a tyrannical impulse, which then is carried out through the will. Or rather, we should say that what the word will describes is that very uh, tyranny of an impulse. Um, when we remove these magical ideas of freedom of the will or the ego consciousness, the soul superstition, uh, the ideas of Plato and Christianity, what we have left is a tyrannical world. And so even in our supposed attempts to bring forward this egalitarian utopian world, where all are merely servants of one another as part of this grand utilitarian project, or whatever the conception of you know the technocrats of today might be, the result is that they just create the subtlest tyranny that has ever been created, because morality is a tyrannical impulse, uh, yet again. And uh, Nietzsche, ironically, seems to have some admiration or regard for this new type of tyrant, because he has an absence of prejudice. And we should take that in a very neutral sense, prejudgment, right? Um, an absence of biases or we might say dogmatic commitments within his thought due to the tremendous manifoldness of practice art and mask so the entire the entirety of every european culture and all of its cultural products and wisdom available to you you have a great manifoldness at your fingertips now allowing you to be uh, nomadic and thus not solely committed to one perspective or another and the, this is the kind of tyrant of the spirit, right? Nietzsche says, including the most spiritual sense of that word, whom he sees coming up. And that is, in a sense, how you could describe the philosopher of the future. If he's to be a commander and self-legislator, it's as a spiritual tyrant, a spiritual Napoleon, if you will, in a world where everyone wants to obey where they're all solely concerned with being a good person in the eyes of others, the real philosopher is the person who arrives and dares to legislate for himself what his moral valuations will be. And occasionally someone like that comes along 
who can, they win over the hearts and minds of others, right? Um, they become the person that is obeyed. Let's move on to 243, which will be a very quick aphorism because it's Nietzsche saying poetically what he has just said, quote, I hear with pleasure that our sun is swiftly moving toward the constellation of Hercules. And I hope that man on this earth will in this respect follow the sun's example. And first of all, we good Europeans, end quote. Uh, so to follow the example of the great larger than life Greek mythological hero, this demigod, this person who was more than a man, who, what is the story of Hercules? This daring hero who exposes himself to mortal danger over and over and over again. This kind of courageous daring wrestling with the Nemean lion, right? I think the only comment I have on this is that it is a, uh, I would say, a breadcrumb in understanding where Nietzsche is getting his overman idea. Uh, the the Olympians are, in some sense, the mold or the, the blueprint for that idea. And Hercules is a perfect sort of bridge between man and God because he is demigod. Okay, uh, let's go to 244. And I'll be abridging in a couple places uh, when reading from this section because it's rather long and I think the point is well made um, without having to read the entire thing. But there are several important uh, chunks of this aphorism I want to consider. Quote, there was a time when it was customary to attribute profundity to the Germans as a distinction. Now that the most successful type of the new Germanism lusts after utterly different honors, some doubt may almost be timely and patriotic as to whether that former praise was not based on self-deception. In short, whether German profundity is not at bottom something different and worse and something that one is about to shake off successfully. Let us make the attempt to relearn about German profundity. Nothing more is needed for this than a little vivisection of the German soul. The German soul is above all manifold, of diverse origins, more put together and superimposed than actually built. That is due to where it comes from. A German who would make bold to say, two souls, alas, are dwelling in my breast, would violate the truth rather grossly, or, more precisely, would fall short of the truth by a good many souls. Um, end quote. And that is a quote from Faust there. Two souls, alas, are dwelling in my breast, um, is line 1112 of Goethe's play. Okay, continuing uh, and skipping a little further down, quote, in every sense the Germans are more incomprehensible, comprehensive, contradictory, unknown, incalculable, surprising, even frightening than other people are to themselves. They elude definition and would be on that account alone the despair of the French. It is characteristic of the Germans that the question, what is German, never dies out among them. End quote. And so before we continue with the passage, I would just say, there is an aspect here that I didn't really mention before where I was sort of talking about the Germans as maybe going through an Alexandrian period, and Nietzsche talks about that a little bit now, that there's this sort of new Germanism that uh, lusts after utterly different honors than before. So the Germans used to be, you know, way back in the time of the, the Holy Roman Empire, Germany was the, the center and the, the core of European civilization, but that period is long, long over. And for centuries, the Germans are sort of like the artistic and the spiritual soul of Europe, but they don't manifest that in any sort of like coherent single political power. Uh, Germany is divided in between all of these sort of different rival, you know, princedoms and so on and so forth. And, you know, it's not until the time of Bismarck, as Nietzsche points out, that the Germans become addicted to real politic and become a political people with this hyper-nationalistic focus. And so what I was focusing on with the Meistersinger and, and Wagner's music is sort of how Wagner is at the end of this long period of uh, productivity within the German culture. Um, and yet, there, so that's the way in which the Germans are always oriented towards the past, but the way in which they're always oriented towards the day after tomorrow, which is another thing that Nietzsche says, is that they are, they've always been manifold. They've always been made up of a mix of peoples and polities and 
you know, divided between Catholicism and Protestantism and, uh, you know, divided between the attitudes and the way of life of Northern versus Southern Germany and um, even just the aspects of Christianity and paganism, um, you know, and the, the traditions of the Teutonic pagans versus the, um, you know, asceticism of Christianity and so on and so forth. That in a in a sense, if a people is something that is sort of drawn together and bound together by these shared valuations that are physiological and created by the uh, the, the physical geographical conditions, um, if that's if it's sort of like you take this disparate material and then sort of crush it together and forge it, um, you know, or smash it together and create a diamond or something like that, the Germans were never um, they never completed that process. As another way of, of, of putting it, uh, at least as Nietzsche indicates here, that's why the question, what is German, has never really died out because they that's a very long process to refine that question and determine, um, to, to reach a definite answer as to what that means. And perhaps we might even raise the possibility that, you know, the, the, the notion of the state of Germany or the, the German civilization or culture or whatever we want to call it, Maybe it even comes about during a time when even way back during the era of Frederick II, who Nietzsche has talked about earlier, um, and the creation of the Holy Roman Empire, that um, this was already the beginning of the logic of the democratization of Europe, or of the creation of the European man versus just a you know, the person of an individual sort of national identity, because that in and of itself is the project of the Holy Roman Empire to recreate this pan-European empire once again. And Nietzsche has very um, good things to say about um, that whole project back in the day, um, elsewhere in his work. But we'll skip a little further down into the text. Quote, What did Goethe really think about the Germans? There were many things around him about which he never spoke spoke clearly, and his lifelong he was a master of subtle silence. He probably had good reasons for that. What is certain is that it was not the wars of liberation that made him look up more cheerfully any more than the French Revolution, the event on whose account he rethought his Faust. Indeed, the whole problem of man was the appearance of Napoleon. There are words of Goethe in which he deprecates with impatient hardness as if he belonged to a foreign country, what the Germans take pride in. The celebrated German Gemut he wants to find as indulgence toward the weakness of others, as well as one's own. Was he wrong in that? It is characteristic of the Germans that one is rarely completely wrong about them. End quote. Uh, and Kaufman notes that word Gemut, a word without any exact equivalent in English. It is variously rendered as feeling, soul, heart. Um, so, uh, and he lists another word, gemütlich, might be translated as comfortable or cozy. So in Goethe, Nietzsche sees a, a kindred spirit, I think, of a German who speaks of the Germans as though he were not himself one of them, as if he is able to hold his Germanness at a distance and criticize it, which is often what Nietzsche does as well. And he brings up the, the famous incident of Goethe's um, praise of Napoleon, which was something that was perhaps also influential on Nietzsche himself. And he points out uh, of the great political events going on at that time, the uh, because Faust, as we talked about in the episode on Faust, was a lifelong work for Goethe. And uh, th this in and of itself, Nietzsche sort of implies, is a very German thing that Goethe felt the need to work on this play as a project that spanned from the time of his 20s to, I believe, when he was 80 years old and he finishes it right before he dies. And, you know, the great political events of the time don't interest him except for the appearance of Napoleon. That's what has an influence on the uh, work of Faust. Um, so we'll continue here. Quote, The German soul has its passageways and interpassageways. There are caves, hideouts, and dungeons in it. Its disorder has a good deal of the attraction of the mysterious. The German is an expert on secret paths to chaos. And just as everything loves its simile, the German loves clouds and everything that is unclear, becoming, twilight, 
damp and overcast, whatever is in any way uncertain, unformed, blurred, growing, he feels to be, quote, profound. The German himself is not, he becomes, he develops. Development is therefore the truly German find and hit in the great realm of philosophical formulas, a governing concept that, united with German beer and German music, is at work trying to Germanize the whole of Europe, end quote. And there's an irony here that I wonder if Nietzsche himself is aware of. Um, when he's saying that the German soul has its passageways and interpassageways, how does Nietzsche describe his own soul? He uses the language of the labyrinth and the minotaurs within it. Uh, you know, he, here he says, the German soul has its caves and hideouts and dungeons. Its disorder has a good deal of the attraction of the mysterious. Nietzsche we could say that's an attraction people find in his work. He's an expert on secret paths to chaos. Um, and what does he say? The German loves clouds and everything that is unclear. Nietzsche says he tries his hardest to be misunderstood himself, to be unclear to those who don't have a right for him. And then the last thing he says, the German himself is not, he becomes, he develops. And he says the only truly German find and hit in the great realm of philosophical formulas. Well, Nietzsche is a philosopher of becoming. He's, he, uh, Zarathustra loves man not for what he is, but because he's a bridge and not a goal. So this, too, could describe Nietzsche's work. Then he pairs that with German beer and German music, two things we know Nietzsche generally has a negative opinion of as things that are sort of corrupting Europe. And in... In light of his broader comments about the Germans, as you know, they haven't really, they haven't tied or tethered together what their actual identity is. They haven't yet become. So they're still in sort of an indeterminate people. This is the sense in which it is perhaps a weakness, the German not being anything and sort of trapped in this state of becoming. And perhaps the unhealthy thing about it is that they are a people with their eye on yesterday and the day after tomorrow rather than on the present which is where the becoming actually happens, where you actually become. Uh, and so, you know, this passage could be a bit hard to suss out. I think the interesting thing, though, is that in the same way that you could also apply what a lot of what Nietzsche says about Goethe to Nietzsche himself, and then you could even draw from that that the perhaps even the trait of being able to regard your Germanness as something that you can stand apart from and criticize um, is maybe itself a German trade. And many of the things Nietzsche seems to criticize here about the Germans um, are traits that Nietzsche himself seems to manifest at times. Um, so uh, we'll finish out the passage. Quote, Foreigners stand amazed and fascinated before the riddles posed for them by the contradictory nature at the bottom of the German soul, brought into a system by Hegel, and finally set to music by Richard Wagner. Um, end quote. So Hegel, his whole system of dialectics is that system of opposition. And of course, we already talked about the manifold nature of Richard Wagner's music. So we'll continue. Quote, good-natured and vicious, such a conjunction, preposterous in relation to any other people, is unfortunately justified too often in Germany. Let anyone live for a while among Swabians. Skipping down a little further, whoever wants a demonstration of the German soul should merely look into German taste. What boorish indifference to taste. How the noblest stands right next to the meanest. How disorderly and rich this whole psychic household is. The German drags his soul along. Whatever he experiences, he drags. He digests his events badly. He never gets done with them. German profundity is often merely a hard and sluggish digestion. Perhaps the German of today knows no more dangerous and successful disguise than this confiding, accommodating, cards-on-the-table manner of German honesty. This is his true Mephistopheles art. With that, he can still go far. And uh, at the end of the passage, Nietzsche makes a comment which Kaufman suggests is dubious etymology, uh, where Nietzsche says it's not for nothing that one is called the Tusch Volk, the Tausch Volk, deceiver people, which he's suggesting as an etymology for the word Deutsch, which is not, uh, is not the conventional accepted etymology for the word Deutsch deriving from the deceiver people. But, um, okay, so end quote, and 
I think all I really have to say about this is the lines about how the German drags his soul along. Whatever he experiences, he drags. He digests his events badly. He never gets done with them. That's really the meaning of the German having his eye always to the past. And that's the very reason why the German as a people has not yet become anything, forged itself into something that is, because then they're always looking off for the day after tomorrow for that to happen. Again, there are some very interesting criticisms of Nietzsche that one could make um, based on his own words here. But, uh, you know, even the, what does he say? The German's honesty is a dangerous and successful disguise. That's his Mephistophelian art, his all the cards on the table type of honesty. Even that is a form of deception. And yet again, I mean, what can we think of from earlier in the text? What Nietzsche says about the mask. I'm going to be the philosopher who lays all the cards on the table and takes off the mask and shows you that what all philosophers are doing is really a mask for this tyrannical impulse that they have, this involuntary and unconscious autobiography that they're writing. Um, his, he admits that he's deceiving you. Isn't he so honest? That's according to Nietzsche's own description here, a very German thing that he's doing. And so I think, again, I, as I said, I'm not sure how aware Nietzsche is of the irony here, but Nietzsche is a very smart guy, so something tells me he is aware of it and that he recognizes that there is something so very German in his rejection and criticism of the German culture that um, in the same way that you know, only during the time of the decline of Athens could there be a Socrates. Only amongst these people that Nietzsche has described, which are so divided and unable to, to what would we say, reconcile the manifold contradictions within them, uh, culturally forging it into an identity, and have accordingly uh, just said, well, you know, as in the case of Hegel that Nietzsche suggests, and this was the old style of, of the German gaining profundity, right, was the philosophical German, the musical genius as German, the playwright uh, German, right? This was the profundity of past ages, and what they did was, you know, in the case of Hegel, instantiate the sense of divided opposition into an entire philosophical system, saying that's the entire basis of reality, rather than um, actually an attempt at harmonizing that contradiction. Goethe's Faust has two souls within his heart, or he feels two souls within his heart. Um, this is the uh, very nature of the German peoples, that manifoldness, that indeterminateness, that dividedness, that opposition within. Um, only in that environment could a Nietzsche emerge amongst these people who are forever dragging the past, but also with an eye to the day after tomorrow. And that is indeed what Nietzsche writes for, is the, the philosophers of the future. It's the prelude to the philosophy of the future. And so I think this has to be a, another self-aware moment for Nietzsche. Even his um, anti-Germanness is in some ways so German. Uh, but that's Yet another beyond good and evil, or another immoralist observation, isn't it, of the anti-Germanists built on a foundation of Germanists, the contra contradictions uh, as the foundation of one another, rather than uh, mutually exclusive. Which again, um, even though Nietzsche is so opposed to Hegel in so many ways, in the broad strokes there are so many um, s odd similarities between the two of them. We'll move on to 245. And I'm not going to read this passage. Um, this will be one of the ones that we skip and I just summarize. Although unlike the other ones, it's not because we've already gotten the point across or because we've already read it in another episode, but rather because 245 is Nietzsche's analysis of different phases in the uh, sort of the history of German music. He starts out talking about Mozart, Beethoven, then the Romantic period and music after that. This is all the music after Beethoven was essentially Romanticism. And uh, it was all sort of inferior music that, that failed to make an impact. Uh, it wasn't valid anywhere except in the theaters and before crowds. 
and then he talks about Felix Mendelssohn and Sh- and uh, Mendelssohn and Schumann, um, composers that he believes are different from this, who nevertheless came later. Uh, and then he he ends the passage by saying uh, that the greatest danger for German music is that it loses the voice for the soul of Europe and descends to mere fatherlandishness. Um, the reason why we're not going to go into detail about this is because there's so many references to so many different things, some of which, like, I, I, I made a point uh, at one point in my study of Nietzsche of going and listening to all the music that he talks about, because you can go listen to it, right? This is all um, stuff that was composed hundreds of years ago and has been performed many, many, many times. And there are free recordings now available on YouTube or wherever else you want to listen. But, um, you know, it would just take us too long to discuss every single reference in this passage. And if that's something you're interested in, there's no substitute for going and listening to the music yourself. So that's what I would recommend that you do. Um, And I'm sure we've all heard Mozart and Beethoven, but, you know, uh, trying to listen with a feel for what Nietzsche is talking about um, when he describes each of these uh, periods or figures within German music. So uh, we'll go now to 246. Quote, What torture books written in German are for anyone who has a third ear? How vexed one stands before the slowly revolving swamp of sounds that do not sound like anything, and rhythms that do not dance, called a, quote, book among Germans. Yet worse is the German who reads books. How lazily, how reluctantly, how badly he reads. How many Germans know and demand of themselves that they should know that there is art in every good sentence, art that must be figured out if the sentence is to be understood. A misunderstanding about its tempo, for example, and the sentence itself is misunderstood. That one must not be in doubt about the rhythmically decisive syllables, that one experiences the break with any excessively severe symmetry as deliberate and attractive, that one lends a subtle and patient ear to every staccato and every rubato, that one figures out the meaning and the sequence of vowels and diphthongs, and how delicately and richly they can be colored and change colors as they follow each other. Who among book-reading Germans has enough goodwill to acknowledge such duties and demands and to listen to that much art and purpose and language? In the end, one simply does not have the ear for that, and thus the strongest contrasts of style go unheard. The subtlest artistry is wasted on, as on the deaf. These were my thoughts when I noticed how clumsily and undiscerningly two masters in the art of prose were confounded one whose words drop hesitantly and coldly as from the ceiling of a damp cave. He counts on their dull sound and resonance, and another who handles his language like a flexible rapier, feeling from his arm down to his toes the dangerous delight of the quivering, oversharp blade that desires to bite, hiss, cut. End quote. So, uh, going back to the issue of tempo... This whole passage could be seen as an elaboration on some of the comments Nietzsche made back in part two, uh, the section on the free spirit, and remarks he said about the Germans being unable to understand the tempo of somebody who thinks at the pace that, say, Nietzsche does, at the speed at which the Ganges flows versus the Germans who think at the pace of a tortoise. But here he's talking about the whole sound of language, and in a way... The poetry, I mean, he says the art of language, the art that should be in every sentence, that this is not separable from the attempt to strictly communicate a intelligible meaning. That in some sense, we could learn a great deal about the Germans by the fact that they have no ear for this art, that as Nietzsche alleges, what passes for a, a book is simply, you know, it's just a, a sequence of sounds with no regard to how every staccato feels, how every syllable flows together, and how the music of the language affects, we might say, the sensation of hearing it, and thus what our experience with it will be. And I could see some people being, or I could see someone being skeptical of what Nietzsche sang here, like, okay, yeah, but does that really matter in conveying the meaning? Well, I think Nietzsche himself is sort of the proof of the case, right? Because in terms of the actual ideas that Nietzsche puts forward, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay them. Uh, he does put forward some profound, insightful uh, things. But as I've often mentioned, what really hooks people in 
<laughs> when it comes to, to Nietzsche is the fact that he's such a great writer. What does it mean to say he's a great writer? Well, he prides himself on being a master of the use of language in a way that is rapier-witted, that does, you know, hiss and cut and, um, you know, Nietzsche's words can sting, they can um, seduce, they can evoke all of this uh, sort of rich emotional life. And it has this effect on people that it actually feels like a whole experience to read Nietzsche. Um, and you feel like you, there is a, a, a sort of a style that lives within his language that has a personality to it and that um, is enjoyable to read. And it's fun because it's it's like an adventure going and reading Nietzsche. And contrast that with, you know, the work of Kant or, you know, pick <laughs> pick your philosopher that, to contrast with Nietzsche because almost all of them will be an unfavorable comparison. Um, and just consider how, I, like, I guess I would just say, like, there are many philosophers who have put forward ideas that are at least as interesting as the ideas of Nietzsche's. I'll come out and say that right now as the Nietzsche podcast guy, um, that it's not as if he was, um, you know, th that much more like far more intelligent and complex than Hegel. If anything, I think Hegel is far more complex than Nietzsche, we might say. I'm not saying he's more correct, but uh, he's he probably is certainly more complex. Um, but why is Nietzsche more popular of a read? Why is he... Why does he have a more direct, immediate influence and impact in the minds of people today than Hegel does, insofar as he's just simply more popular to read and therefore be influenced by? It's because of that living style that Nietzsche attends to, and it, that it does affect, um, you know, there, you could say a lot of what Nietzsche says in a very clinical way of just trying to convey the information, but it wouldn't have the force of build your temples on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius, live dangerously, right? That you can hear, and I mean, even this is a translation, right? But that's another thing about Kaufman that is often underrated. And I'm hearing more and more Kaufman criticism recently. Much of it is not invalid. It's simply aspects like that, uh, that the, of Kaufman's translation of trying to retain and capture the style and the music and the power of Nietzsche's uh, metaphors and the way that he uses language, his um, Nietzschean oxymorons and all of these things that Kaufman tries to translate into English, um, I think it can be easy to underrate that aspect of Kaufman because uh, he might present some of the ideas in a softened way or however you want to put it. Okay, so uh, we'll move on to 247. And again here, I'm not going to read this whole section because much of what he does here is to reiterate some of these criticisms of the Germans or rather put it into different terms. Um, it will read the first sentence, quote, how little German style has to do with sound in the ears is shown by the fact that precisely our good musicians write badly, um, end quote. And what follows is a more of a sort of a criticism of we might say German rhetoric and speaking or the German ideas of, of eloquence, which might seem like an odd thing to focus on, but until you recall that Nietzsche has great respect for the rhetoricians and the sophists and sees uh, the, the sophist art of rhetoric as a legitimate school and a legitimate art, quite in contradiction to the Socratic school. But um, the importance of this uh, I think really only comes into play by the end of the passage where he says, quote, in Germany, there really was until quite recently, only a single species of public and roughly artful rhetoric, that from the pulpit. In Germany, the preacher alone knew what a syllable weighs or a word and how a sentence strikes, leaps, plunges, runs, runs out. He alone had a conscience in his ears, often enough a bad conscience for there is no lack of reasons why Germans rarely attain proficiency in rhetoric, and almost always too late. The masterpiece of German prose is therefore, fairly enough, the masterpiece of its greatest preacher. 
The Bible has so far been the best German book. Compared with Luther's Bible, almost everything else is mere literature, something that did not grow in Germany and therefore also didn't, did not grow and does not grow into German hearts as the Bible did. End quote. We might think of the lines in Zarathustra, um, and I'm forgetting the verbatim quotation here, but how there are those who do not wish to be read, but to be learned by heart. Those who inscribe their aphorisms with their blood or however exactly it's put. And that the Bible found its way into the German heart. Why? Because it was true literature. Again, maybe the argument I was making with Nietzsche being so... Um, uh, effective, so powerful in his language, applies tenfold here to Luther's Bible. Luther is a preacher, and in Germany, the preacher alone had this power over language, and perhaps because they had uh, that very book as sort of a uh, help in the instruction of how to uh, use the poetry and the art of language in order to seduce hearts, win hearts and minds. And uh, this reveals so much about, you know, the the Socratic underestimation of rhetoric out of this platonic belief in the truth, right? In the unvarnished, essential, pure truth, the pure pursuit of truth and pursuit of knowledge above what? These mere appearances, these masks of rhetoric, these attempts to manipulate and persuade people. So the refusal to understand this tyrannical world that in which we actually live in which that is actually the function and purpose of the art of speech is to seduce uh, that's a way of capturing or, or dominating over uh, other human hearts that's the accounts for the success of uh so you know a document like the bible so the german neglect of rhetoric out of perhaps this platonic uh, hangover that all of Europe was uh, sort of under the spell of, um, opens the way such that the preacher is the only one with this artful power over speech in order to win hearts and minds. And you could say that that was true in many places in Europe, but perhaps no more true than in Germany. And I think this critique, so on that sole basis, is actually very profound. Okay, uh, and there, there we go. I'm attributing German profundity to Nietzsche. Look at me. Okay, 248, quote, There are two types of genius, one which above all begets and wants to beget, and another which prefers being fertilized and giving birth. Just so there are among peoples of genius those to whom the woman's problem of pregnancy and the secret task of forming, maturing, and perfecting has been allotted. The Greeks, for example, were a people of this type, also the French, and others who must fertilize and become the causes of new orders of life, like the Jews, the Romans, and asking this in all modesty, the Germans. Peoples tormented and enchanted by unknown fevers and irresistibly pressed beyond themselves in love and lusting after foreign races, after those who like, quote, being fertilized, and at the same time domineering like all that knows itself to be full of creative powers and hence by the grace of God. These two types of genius seek each other like man and woman, but they also misunderstand each other like man and woman. Uh, end quote. And so Kaufman notes here, Nietzsche is inverting an anti-Semitic idea that the Jews are uncreative uh, parasites and they excel only as performers and interpreters. This is the, the, the way that they um, are often characterized in Kaufman's words. But uh, we might say in the sense that um, the Jewish people um, are, you know, a people that are sort of condemned to wander Europe without really having a homeland within Europe. Um, and Nietzsche, I mean, there's no way around the sort of vulgar sexual metaphor. They inseminate Europe with their own culture, with their own religion, their own values, or their own creativity, or what have you, that the, the masculine and feminine metaphor is very much on the nose here. And so it, in a way, the metaphor is so strong that it doesn't really bear further explaining. It is interesting because it is one of those ways in which, you know, when people talk about the master and slave morality and 
And then they point out how Nietzsche says at the end of Genealogy of Morals, essay one, that beyond good and evil doesn't mean beyond good and bad, and that, of course, he thinks the master morality is good, the slave morality is bad. And there's a sense in which they are right, sort of, but um, Nietzsche, I think, has a more mature view than that, and that he sees the ways in which there might be a genius for being the receptive or the the uh, the mother archetype of a civilization. Um, and that this might not always mean that you were actually, if you were the assertive and creative and, uh, you know, the creatively powerful force, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are politically powerful or at the top of an actual political hierarchy. And again, it's, it's precisely at the moment when the Germans become political in their focus and, um, you know, nationalistic and so on and so forth, trying to create the Second Reich that Nietzsche it becomes hypercritical of them and has much more better things to say about the Germans, uh, even as though he's criticized them throughout this whole uh, chapter um, from the more, the period when the Germans were conquering in the worlds of philosophy and music and drama and so on and so forth. And so here, you know, the, the male and the female, the masculine and the fem feminine are called two types of genius that require one another and fail to understand one another. And I think that's perhaps uh, more praise for the feminine from Nietzsche. Um, he even calls the Greeks here uh, a feminine culture. And the meaning of that is that Nietzsche was somewhat ahead of his time in insisting that the uh, Greeks owed a cultural debt to earlier civilizations, that they didn't create the Greek culture or civilization out of whole cloth. Let's go to 249. Quote, Every people has its own tartuffery, and calls it its virtues. What is best in us, we do not know. We cannot know. End quote. Tartuffery refers to Tartuffe from, I believe, Moliere is the play. And he's a hypocrite. He's a pretender. He plays at being something that he isn't. There's a, an element of the sort of uh, the religious or the spiritual as well, insofar as um, that is the way in which Tartuffe is a pretender or hypocrite. Uh, and so every people has its own tartuffery and calls it its virtues. What is best in us, we do not know, we cannot know. This is a, an aphorism that would seem to belong among the epigrams because there's so much condensed into this um, sentence that we could just simply take, uh, take it at face value yet again. But just what I would tease out here as my sole remark is that the attempt to articulate what our virtues are using virtue in that older sense of the word as a strength or character aspect within us, and that everything great or rare or extraordinary about a human being is going to be cheapened when we put it into the moral language that everyone can understand, that we can communicate linguistically is even to cheapen it in some way. And because what is best in us, we do not know, we cannot know. It can't be brought into conscious articulation because in some sense it is much vaster than that or so peculiar that to put it into such common terms, to attempt to put a word on it that then stands for a concept that could be equated with, you know, if your courage, your bravery could be equated with just this concept of bravery that could be found in all sorts of other people. Um, even that is to sort of cheapen what your true virtue might be. And I'm struggling to find the words because I think uh, we might not we might not even have the words to really explain it any better than Nietzsche already has. But that, to some extent, virtue, when made into a conception that is widely held and part of the moral code of, you know, a commonly understood set of enumerated virtues or whatever it might be, always becomes a sort of moral pose. It always leads to that tartuffery. Um, and that even to present virtue in such a way as something deontological is its own tartuffery in and of itself. It already is tartuffery from the beginning. To, to take what is involuntary, right? Virtue is involuntary and unconscious and make it into a duty is inherently to become a pretender or a hypocrite. Let's go to 250. Quote, 
What Europe owes to the Jews? Many things, good and bad, and above all, one thing that is both of the best and of the worst. The grand style in morality. The terribleness and majesty of infinite demands, infinite meanings, the whole romanticism and sublimity of moral questionabilities, and hence precisely the most attractive, captious, and choicest part of those plays of color and seductions to life, in whose afterglow the sky of our European culture, its evening sky, is burning now perhaps burning itself out. We artists among the spectators and philosophers are grateful for this to the Jews. End quote. And um, Kaufman extrapolates uh, this passage into being of profound, profound importance to understanding the entire work. And before I read, I want to read his, his uh, footnote on this, actually, because I do think it's a very good argument or a very forceful argument that he puts forward that will help us with understanding the book. But I'll just say all of the things he describes, it really reminds me of the way Nietzsche talks about the Old Testament, the grand style and morality. And remember how he talks about that, that even the Greek and Indian canons have nothing to compare with the grand style of morality uh, within the Jewish Old Testament. And uh, so I think he, he reads something of that into like the Jewish character, or the Jewish psyche. But uh, let's get on to Kaufman's note. He says, um, quote, He is hoping to initiate a revaluation comparable to that ascribed to the Jews in section 195. Of course, he does not agree with the values he ascribes to them, but the whole book represents an effort to rise beyond simple-minded agreement and disagreement, beyond the vulgar faith and antithetic values, beyond good and evil. The point of the title is not that the author considers himself beyond good and evil in the crudest sense, but it is in part that he is beyond saying such silly things as the Jews are good or the Jews are evil, or free spirits, or scholars, or virtues, or honesty, or humaneness are good or evil. Everywhere he introduces distinctions, etching first one type and then another, both generally confounded under a single label. He asks us to shift perspectives or to perceive hues and gradations instead of simple black and white. This has led superficial readers to suppose that he contradicts himself or that he never embraces any meaningful conclusions. But this book abounds in conclusions. Only one can never be sure what they are as long as one tears sentences and half sentences out of contexts or even whole aphorisms. Section 240 is meant to be read before section 241, not in isolation. End quote. And so, um, while I think Kaufman might put it a little bit too, ironically, I think Kaufman puts it a bit too crudely here, but in many ways he is correct that um, this passage, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why Kaufman chooses this passage to, to bring this out, but um, in this passage we see that common uh, methodology of Nietzsche's that, you know, he invites us within the span of very few sentences to stand at multiple vantage points and behold all the different sides or angles of a phenomenon, or in this case of a people, or whatever it might be. And the entire book operates from this premise of the immoralism, as we've called it, and as Nietzsche calls it, of being able to withhold from fixing your moral valuations on things. Now, of course, we are the measuring animal, the valuing animal. So you will eventually put your moral valuations on things, whether you like it or not. But recognizing those moral valuations for what they are, and therefore being able to stand apart from them when you're trying to, um, for lack of a better word, to use a common turn of phrase, gain perspective on what the reality of the situation is. Um, and that is actually a common turn of phrase that has a lot of, uh, it's a very helpful metaphor to gain perspective, that more perspective is good in terms of um, fully understanding any issue you're trying to think about philosophically or otherwise. And that the moral, the, the fixture of moral praise or blame, while that process is still undergoing, while you're trying to understand, um, is actually going to pollute your thinking. It's a uh, moralic acid, as Nietzsche says, and the Antichrist. And so, um, you know, being able to dismiss that from your mind, at least provisionally, 
is a large part of what Nietzsche is doing in this book. And that it's not simply that Nietzsche is wants us to be beyond good and evil in the sense of, you know, uh, living our lives like, you know, uh, Dexter or something like that. <laughs> Although Dexter is actually a very moralistic character, but so maybe that's a bad example, but you know, you know what I mean? That N Nietzsche's point, yes, it's not just to be beyond good and evil in the crude sense of, um, you know, just go be a psychopath. I don't think that's Nietzsche's goal at all, but he is, um, the, I would just say the, the moral tendencies in our thoughts, the moralizing tendencies, um, that delimit what we're even allowed to think about or question are so powerful. And especially in those of us who think that we are beyond them <laughs> as modern people, because we're beyond our traditional moralities, which does not mean we do not have uh, moral impositions from the collective on us at all times. Um, so just breaking out of that, uh, this book's project, I think, does go well beyond this. And the true meaning of beyond good and evil does go well beyond this. It's not just simply, oh, well, Nietzsche wants to do away with crude dichotomies. Well, that suggests that there's like a subtle dichotomies that Nietzsche wants to hold on to. And I don't think that that's necessarily accurate. I think that uh, he truly does want to break down the entire premise of how we craft uh, dichotomies within our thought based on we could maybe say Kaufman gets close to the mark if he were to say essentialist dichotomies. Um, nevertheless, th th it does get more complicated because there is a, we might say there's a dichotomy between health and sickness, or he talks about this as the Dionysus versus the crucified idea. But that's not a really a more subtle dichotomy. And in, in a certain point of view, you could say that's like the crudest dichotomy there is because it's Nietzsche being anti-dialectical seeing it as a true, truly opposed dichotomy. Even that, though, I would call into question because of the ways in which health always leads to sickness. And sickness and decay is the, it's like the, the soil or the detritus out of which new things grow. So uh, even that is not really, um, it's not like an essentialist dichotomy. That's probably takes us too far afield. But especially considering this passage. I'm talking more about Kaufman's commentary than the actual passage, but uh, oh well, what better place for talking about that? So with all of this, we will move on to 251. Quote, It must be taken into the bargain if all sorts of clouds and disturbances and brief little attacks of habitation pass over the spirit of a people that is suffering and wants to suffer of nationalistic nerve fever and political ambition. Examples among the Germans today uh, include now the anti-French stupidity, now the anti-Jewish, now the anti-Polish, now the Christian Romantic, now the Wagnerian, now the Teutonic, now the Prussian. And whatever other names these little mystifications of the German spirit and conscience may have, forgive me, for during a brief daring sojourn in very infected territory, I too did not altogether escape this disease, and began, like everyone else, to develop notions about matters that are none of my business, the first sign of the political infection. For example, about the Jews. Only listen. I have not met a German yet who was well disposed toward the Jews. And however unconditionally all the cautious and politically minded repudiated real anti-Semitism, even this caution and policy are not directed against the species of this feeling itself, but only against its dangerous immoderation, especially against the insipid and shameful expression of this immoderate feeling. About this, one should not deceive oneself. That Germany has amply enough Jews, that the German stomach, the German blood has trouble, and will still have trouble for a long time, digesting even this quantum of Jew, as the Italians, French, and English have done, having a stronger digestive system. That is the clear testimony and language of a general instinct to which one must listen, in accordance with which one must act. Admit no more Jews, and especially close the doors to the East, also to Austria. Thus commands the instinct of a people whose type is still weak and indefinite, so it could easily be blurred or extinguished by a stronger race. The Jews, however, are beyond any doubt the strongest, toughest, and purest race now living in Europe. They know how to prevail even under the worst conditions, even better than under favorable conditions, by means of virtues that today one would like to mark as vices, thanks above all to a resolute faith that they need not be ashamed before modern ideas. They change when they change. 
always only as the Russian Empire makes its conquests, being an empire that has time and is not of yesterday, namely according to the principle as slowly as possible. A thinker who has the development of Europe on his conscious, conscience will, in all his projects for this future, take into account the Jews as well as the Russians as the provisionally surest and most probable factors in the great play and fight of forces. What is called a nation in Europe today, and is really rather a res facta than a res nata, and occasionally can hardly be told from a res ficta et picta, is in any case something evolving, young, and easily changed, not yet a race, let alone such an ere perineus as the Jewish type. These nations really should carefully avoid every hot-headed rivalry and hostility, that the Jews, if they wanted it, or if they were forced into it, which seems to be what the anti-Semites want, could even now have a preponderance, indeed quite literally, mastery over Europe, that is certain. That they are not working and planning for that is equally certain. Meanwhile, they want and wish, rather, even with some import importunity, to be absorbed and assimilated by Europe. They long to be fixed, permitted, respected somewhere at long last, putting an end to the nomad's life, to the wandering Jew. And this bent in impulse, which may even express an attenuation of the Jewish instincts, should be noted well and accommodated. To that end, it might be useful and fair to expel the anti-Semitic screamers from the country, accommodated with all caution, with selection, approximately as the English nobility does. Skipping a little further down in the passage, quote, But here it is proper to break off my cheerful Germanomania and holiday oratory, for I am beginning to touch on what is serious for me, the European problem, as I understand it, the cultivation of a new caste that will rule Europe, end quote. So we read through that whole thing. Uh, the only things that really need clarifying, um, when he's talking about a res facta rather than a res nata, and then a uh, res ficta et picta, something made, something born, something fictitious and unreal. So he's saying, what is a nation of Europe today? It is uh, really rather something made rather than something born. So artificial rather than something grown. And uh, oftentimes, it's actually something fictitious and not even real. Um, and <laughs> I think that's all relatively clear, given what Nietzsche said. Much of Nietzsche's comments throughout this completely um, destroy any anti-Semitic reading of Nietzsche or any attempt to appropriate him for that uh, um, sort of thinking and show, I think exactly what his problem was with the Germans and their racial agenda. When you really understand what Nietzsche wants, which is the this creation of a new European, not a new German, right? A new European. And how, I mean, think of how he talks about it as well, that we, we have all these sort of wonderful national qualities that have all these different things they can add or offer to the the new European man. And the Jewish people are like one of the best elements you could possibly have. This is basically just a restatement of the same thing he argues all the way back in Human All Too Human. And the Germans um, are afraid of them because they <laughs> they uh, feel like they could be overwhelmed. They are such an indeterminate race of people. They could be overwhelmed or blurred if they were allowed to integrate into their society. They can't absorb them um, and sort of digest the values and the uh, traits that they bring to their society the way that all these other European nations have, which shows the Germans' weakness. And as such, perhaps the best thing that would they could do would be to uh, <laughs> exile all of the anti-Semites from Germany. And of course, the exact opposite is what happens uh, historically. Um, and so I think this is all, um, you know, he brings it back at the end and makes it very clear what he's talking about. This is touching on what is serious for me, the European problem, as I understand it, the cultivation of a new caste that will, will rule Europe, um, that the democratization of Europe, the democratic project in Europe, is this secret path to this new European empire, um, the creation of these commanders and self-legislators and the creation of a new uh, sort of European society. And this then segues into 252, I think, even though it seems to be a non sequitur or a sort of sharp left turn, but he begins this by saying, quote, they are no philosophical race, these Englishmen. 
Bacon signifies an attack on the philosophical spirit. Hobbes' human lock, a debasement and lowering of the value of the concept of philosophy for more than a century. It was against Hume that Kant arose. Uh, it was Locke of whom Schelling said, understandably, I despise Locke. In their fight against the English mechanistic doltification of the world, Hegel and Schopenhauer were of one mind with Goethe, these two hostile brother geniuses in philosophy who strove apart towards opposite poles of the German spirit and in the process wronged each other as only brothers wrong each other. Um, end quote. And Kaufman notes that, that Hegel didn't actually wrong Schopenhauer. He didn't really, wasn't even really aware of Schopenhauer, didn't care about Schopenhauer. It was what Nietzsche is referring to is something we've already talked about in this walkthrough is Schopenhauer's unintelligent wrath against Hegel, his hatred of Hegel for being outshining him and in Schopenhauer's view, taking Kant's philosophy in the wrong direction. Um, and you could say they were both uh, the two sides of the German soul that they elucidate. Hegel, you could say, is like the historical spirit, um, the, the spirit of becoming, right? Uh, and then the other aspect that uh, Schopenhauer brings forward is this um, uh, attempt at grasping the eternal and understanding, um, we might say, timeless truths. That would be one way of comprehending Schopenhauer and Hegel. I mean, Hegel is a, a philosopher who believes in a process of development and evolution towards something. There's a sort of revealed goal within the process of history. Schopenhauer sees history as just a... Uh, um, all of existence as a samsaric cycle um, that never goes anywhere. Um, and, you know, obviously Nietzsche is closer to one than the other, but we might note, I mean, he's just brought up like Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Schelling, these German philosophers who he's criticized throughout this text, and he's been criticizing the, the whole German psyche and <laughs> like artistic, cultural, philosophical project throughout this very section, criticizing the Germans as a people. But um, you can't turn to the English as an alternative. They are not going to be, you know, the forebears of this new, um, these new philosophers. And why? Because they, they're a debasement and lowering of, of the value of the concept of philosophy because they attempt to make the world mechanistic. They attempt to make the political process something systematic, something that can be established by rules and contracts. Um, it's from the British that we get the formulations of utilitarianism, the attempt to make morality into a mechanistic system, a calculable system. And the reason why this is all unphilosophical to Nietzsche, a debasement of philosophy, is that it's a complete detachment from the physiological basis of our existence and a complete flight into this intellectualized, rational, discursive attempt to bound the boundless with formulas. Um, the way Nietzsche puts it, he says, I'll just gloss over this little paragraph here. Um, he, he calls Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, a muddlehead. Um, Nietzsche despises Carlyle in spite of the fact that Carlyle and Nietzsche actually agree on many points, especially politically, but uh, Carlyle's big flaw is that he's English. <laughs> But he says that the muddlehead Carlyle um, knew this, what was lacking in England, uh, because he, it was what was lacking in Carlyle. And he says this was, quote, real power of spirituality, real profundity of spiritual perception in brief philosophy, end quote. Um, the way Nietzsche is using the term spirituality here, I think, is a bit unconventional, but it's in the sense that uh, we were sort of talking about earlier and the way that the um, philosopher wins hearts and minds. That's real spiritual power. And so uh, we'll finish out this passage, uh, albeit again in an abridged form, because there's a lot of references here. But he gets across his point about the English, quote, It is characteristic of such an unphilosophical race that it clings firmly to Christianity. They need its discipline to become moralized and somewhat humanized. The English, being gloomier, more sensual, stronger in will, and more brutal than the Germans, are precisely for that reason more vulgar, also more pious than the Germans. They stand more in need of Christianity. 
For more sensitive nostrils, even this English Christianity still has a typically English odor of spleen and alcoholic dissipation, against which it is needed for good reasons as a remedy. The subtler poison against the coarser. A subtler poisoning is indeed, for clumsy people, some progress, a step towards spiritualization. English clumsiness and peasant seriousness is still disguised most tolerably by the language of Christian gestures and by prayers and singing of psalms. And for those brutes of sots and rakes who formerly learned how to grunt morally under the sway of Methodism, and more recently, again, as a Salvation Army, uh, a penitential spasm may really be the relatively highest achievement of humanity to which they can be raised. That much may be conceded in all fairness. And uh, further down, he says, quote, In the movement of his soul and body, he has no rhythm and dance. Indeed, not even the desire for rhythm and dance. For music, listen to him speak. Watch the most beautiful English woman walk. Finally, listen to them sing. End quote. And so, once again, Nietzsche's criticism of the English there is along the same lines of his criticism of the Germans in so far as... Um, so I don't know if there's like a single word for it. I mean, he talked about the German rhetoric, their style of speaking, the kind of eloquence that they praised, basically the, the preacher being the only true rhetorician and the power that this gave him over the German heart. You could say it's like a lack of artfulness in their very way of life. And he sees this just as much in the English. He sees them as actually being even more dependent on Christianity. You could say they're a further Northern people, right? And remember what he said way back in part three, what is religious about that northern and southern divide. We won't get into that much here, but I think that's very informative here of the English being sort of more extreme in their uh, their systematizing, mechanizing uh, tendencies, which of course filters into their very spirituality, which Nietzsche accordingly says is not really spirituality because it lacks that inner fire, that passion, that art, that thing that's almost impossible to define. And uh, that penitential spasm may actually be, relatively speaking, the highest attainment of humanity that is possible for the English peasant type or that type of moral or cultural sensibility. And what does that mean? Well, the penitential spasm is what Nietzsche describes as sort of, you know, the flight into asceticism, the revulsion at one's own desires and the pursuit of their desires. And the complete transformation from someone who is vicious, concerned with pursuing their vices, into one which is virtuous in the religious sense, who eschews vices and becomes abstinent out of this penitential spasm, this desire to repent, apologize, be sorry for all of their, all of the things that make them a living being, <laughs> all of the things that make them human, right? And to become ashamed of these things. Per, for all of the reasons that Nietzsche said that that was sort of showing mankind an ideal beyond uh, merely living out our existence as smart animals, right? Um, who simply fulfill our animalian desires in a more sophisticated roundabout way through our the attainment of our conscious intellect. The priest actually shows us an ideal that is beyond this in some way. Perhaps that discipline that the English feel they need, um, that discipline is actually good for them, and perhaps that ascetic image is actually the height of what they could really attain, given who and what they are as a people. And so, um, the, you know, Nietzsche is probably harsher on the English than he is on the Germans, which is another thing about Nietzsche that's very German. <laughs> so um, now we'll go to 253 which we're also going to look at in a shorter form because this is sort of an elaboration on the previous point. But he says, quote, there are truths that are recognized best by mediocre minds because they are most congenial to them. There are truths that have charm and seductive powers only for mediocre spirits. We come up against this perhaps disagreeable proposition just now since the spirit of respectable but mediocre Englishmen, I name Darwin, John Stuart Mill, and Herbert Spencer, is beginning to predominate in the middle regions of European taste. Indeed, who would doubt that it is useful that such spirits should rule at times? It would be a mistake to suppose that the spirits of a high type that soar on their own paths would be particularly skillful at determining and collecting many small and common facts 
and then drawing conclusions from them. On the contrary, being exceptions there from the start at a disadvantage when it comes to the rule. End quote. This is a point that Nietzsche has already made <laughs> in past uh, passages. The only um, interesting aspect of this, it was in the, the episode that we uh, entitled The Esoteric. So I believe it was um, material from part two or chapter two of Beyond Good and Evil. The only new information is that he's tying this directly to the English and he has these three mediocre Englishmen. And so we could say that is how Nietzsche conceives of the English as a people with a talent for the common, uh, that their philosophy is an expression of all of those truths, which can be collected from many small and common facts, uh, and which can be ascertained from the most common perspective, lowest common denominator, right? That's how Nietzsche thinks of the English. And I think this accounts for much of Nietzsche's what we might call Nietzsche's unintelligent wrath against Darwin um, is because, uh, you know, it's not as if Nietzsche necessarily disagrees with Darwin. He just, he sees another Englishman trying to mechanize or systematize all of biology. And similarly with John Stuart Mill and Locke and Spencer and um, so on and so forth. And that, uh, of course, the ideas of English philosophy will find purchase among the middle class, the most average common people in every country. And the, uh, what does he say? The quote, the English with their profound normality have once before caused an overall depression of the European spirit. What people call modern ideas or the ideas of the 18th century are also French ideas. Uh, are of English origin. There is no doubt of that. The French have merely been apes and mimes of these ideas. End quote. And so, uh, as much as Nietzsche, you know, had problems with Rousseau and a lot of the, the French politically, in spite of being a big fan of Voltaire and many other French philosophers and aphorists, um, here he places the blame uh, squarely on England, or sees England as sort of the ultimate cul culprit. He says, European vulgarity, the plebeianism of modern ideas, that of England, end quote. And this is a real threat in Nietzsche's view. Um, we might, I don't maybe threat is the wrong word, but um, because again, it's this whole democratic movement Nietzsche has suggested elsewhere in this very chapter of the work might signify or represent the movement towards something which is quite the opposite of these very modern ideas. They might be the path to something else. I, I suppose a better way of putting it than saying that he sees it as a real threat is that he he doesn't think that the mediocritization of the European spirit is something that's just, you know, like kind of a bummer. It's, you know, uh, it is a profoundly terrible fate. It is the strangling or suffocation of everything great and exceptional that could be produced. All of those um, mutations that could uh, serve as the blueprint for future, better iterations of the organism. Uh, those mutations are all um, destroyed or prevented in the name of English normality. And so, once again, the rule versus the exception, something that Nietzsche... Um, sort of chided the French psychologists to take up that question, that the eternal struggle of the rule versus the exception. Well, here we have a another clue to that insofar as the French have simply been aping the English. They've been uh, unduly influenced by this English uh, approach to things. And uh, because Nietzsche sees so much in the French that he loves and thinks um, – is capable of great things and exceptional things in the French spirit or the French culture. Um, maybe he's hoping we can shake the French free of that if they really comprehend this issue of the rule versus the exception. But in any case, the, the rule, the English stand for the rule. And that is a wonderful description of the English even today, isn't it? So uh, let's continue. Um, now, it's funny we brought up the French because 254 is all about the French. But uh, again, I'm not going to read it because there are so many different references and it's a better one to explore on your own. Uh, a lot of what Nietzsche says is context contextual to his time 
and uh, based on a familiarity with a lot of different writers and um, you know events and things. The, however, he does reiterate certain things as well in this passage that we've already gone over. How the Fran the French character he says contains a halfway successful synthesis of the North and the South, which allows them to comprehend many things and to do things which an Englishman could never understand. So, um, in many ways, a recapitulation to comments he's made about the French in earlier chapters as well. And then uh, in two fifty five, Nietzsche returns to the topic of German music, but if we understand German music to be sort of the artistic cultural vector for all of these problems with the Germans that Nietzsche has discussed. Um, we could kind of look at this passage without having to um, directly reference the German music of Nietzsche's day in anything specific, because uh, what Nietzsche says, quote, uh, against German music, all kinds of precautions seem to me to be indicated. Suppose somebody loves the South as I love it, as a great school of convalescence in the most spiritual as well as the most sensuous sense. Uh, well, such a person will learn to be somewhat on his guard against German music because in corrupting his taste, again, it also corrupts his health. Uh, end quote. And then he goes on to describe uh, such a Southerner, not by descent but by faith, so Nietzsche himself, uh, if he should dream of the future of music, he has to dream of the redemption of music from the North. And so this North-South uh, geographic distinction in Europe, which I said I didn't want to go into, but I guess I have to because it's kind of key to the, the final aphorisms of this chapter, this becomes uh, uh, operative again in this aphorism. And really the meaning here, I think, is the the, what would you say, unintellectual, passionate sincerity of the Southern way of life. A sort of, what we might call, what Nietzsche perceives as a um, an uncomplicated sacrifice of the intellect in the Southern faith of the Italians and the Spanish and the still strongly Roman Catholic countries. Um, I think this can be a key to help us explain a lot of how he thinks about the South. Um, and they, you know, of course, the Renaissance comes from Italy, from these southern people. And of course, Nietzsche spends his winter time uh, going down to Genoa and uh, Turin, and I believe in the Piedmont region, um, and spending his time in Italy. And that's sort of a place of convalescence, which he says here uh, he feels in the south, and the redemption of Europe from the pathologies of the northern barbarians of the spirit in Germany and England in favor of a recapturing of the Italian spirit that was the spirit in the Renaissance. This sort of amoral, uh, ambitious, passionate spirit, the kind of uh, spirit by which you have both the Cesare Borgias of the world, but also the Machiavellis and the creation of the Sistine Chapel and all of these things. Um, and so Nietzsche is imagining here in terms of music. His music of the future that Nietzsche hopes for is no longer, certainly not Wagner's music, and it's certainly not German music. And what could the music of the future be? Well, Nietzsche writes, quote, I can imagine a music whose rarest magic would consist in its no longer knowing anything of good and evil. Only now and then some sailor nostalgia, some golden shadows and delicate weaknesses would pass over it. An art that from a great distance would behold, fleeing toward it the colors of a setting moral world that had almost become unintelligible, and that would be hospitable and profound enough to receive such late fugitives. End quote. All right, and with that, we're going to now read uh, the last uh, section here of Peoples and Fatherlands, 256. Quote, Owing to the pathological estrangement which the insanity of nationality has induced and still induces among the peoples of Europe, owing also to the short-sighted and quick-handed politicians who are at the top today with the help of this insanity, without any inkling that their separatist policies can of necessity only be, be intracte policies, owing to all this and much else that today simply cannot be said, the most unequivocal portents are now being overlooked or arbitrarily and mendaciously reinterpreted that Europe wants to become one. 
and all the more profound and comprehensive men of the century, the overall direction of the mysterious workings of their soul was to prepare the way for this new synthesis and to anticipate experimentally the European of the future. Only in their foregrounds, or in weaker hours, say in old age, did they belong to the fatherlandish. They were merely taking a rest from themselves when they became patriots. I am thinking of such human beings as Napoleon, Goethe, Beethoven, Stendhal, Heinrich Hein, Schopenhauer. Do not hold it against me when I in include Richard Wagner, too, with them, for one should not allow oneself to be led astray about him by his own misunderstandings. Geniuses of his type rarely have the right to understand themselves. Even less to be sure by the indecent noise with which the people in France now close themselves off against him and resist him. The fact remains nevertheless that the late French romanticism of the 40s and Richard Wagner belong together most closely and intimately. In all the heights and depths of their needs, they are related, fundamentally related. It is Europe, the one Europe whose soul surges and longs to get further and higher through their manifold and impetuous art. Where? Into a new light? Toward a new sun? But who could express precisely what all these masters of new means of language could not express precisely? What is certain is that the same storm and stress tormented them and that they sought in the same way these last great seekers. Literature dominated all of them up to their eyes and ears. They were the first artists steeped in world literature, and most of them were themselves writers, poets, mediators, and mixers of the arts and senses. As a musician, Wagner belongs among painters, as a poet among musicians, as an artist in general among actors. All of them were fanatics of expression at any price. I should stress Delacroix, who was most closely related to Wagner, all of them great discoverers in the realm of the sublime, also of the ugly and gruesome, and still greater discoverers concerning effects, display, and the art of display windows, all of them talents far beyond their genius, virtuosos through and through, with uncanny access to everything that seduces, allures, compels, overthrows, born enemies of logic and straight lines, lusting after the foreign, the exotic, the tremendous, the crooked and self-contradictory, as human beings, tantaluses of the will, successful plebeians who knew themselves to be incapable, both in their lives and works, of a noble tempo, a lento, take Balzac, for example, unbridled workers, almost self-destroyers through work, antinomians and rebels against custom, ambitious and insatiable, without balance and enjoyment. All of them, broke and collapsed in the end before the Christian cross, with right and reason for who among them would have been profound and original enough for a philosophy of the Antichrist. On the whole, an audaciously daring, magnificently violent type of higher human beings who soared and tore others along to the heights, it fell to them to first teach their century, and it is the century of the crowd, the concept, higher man. Let the German friends of Richard Wagner ponder whether there is in Wagner's art anything outright German, or whether it is not just its distinction that derives from super-German sources and impulses. Nor should it be underestimated to what extent Paris was indispensable for the development of his type, and at the decisive moment the depth of his instincts led him to Paris. His entire manner and self-apostolate could perfect itself only when he saw the model of the French socialists. Perhaps it will be found, after a subtler comparison, that, to the honor of Richard Wagner's German nature, his doings were in every respect stronger, more audacious, harder, and higher than anything a Frenchman of the 19th century could imagine, thanks to the fact that we Germans are still closer to barbarism than the French. Perhaps Wagner's strangest creation is inaccessible, inimitable, and beyond the feelings of the whole so mature Latin race, not only today but forever, the figure of Siegfried, that very free man who may indeed be too much too free, too hard, too cheerful, too healthy, too anti-Catholic for the taste of ancient and mellow cultured peoples. He may even have been a sin against romanticism, this anti-romantic Siegfried. Well, Wagner more than atoned for this sin in his old and glum days when, anticipating a taste that has since then become political, he began, if not to walk, at least to preach, with his characteristic religious vehemence, the way to Rome. Lest these final words be misunderstood, I will enlist the assistance of a few vigorous rhymes which will betray to less subtle ears, too, what I want, what I have against the final Wagner and his Parsifal music. Is this still German? 
Out of a German heart, this sultry screeching. A German body, this self-laceration. German, this priestly affectation. This incense-perfumed, sensual preaching. German, this halting, plunging, reeling. This so uncertain, bim-bam peeling. This nunnish ogling, ave leavening. This whole falsely ecstatic heaven overheavening. Is this still German? You still stand at this gate, perplexed? Think what you hear is Rome, Rome's faith without the text. End quote. And so Nietzsche returns at the end to the topic that he started the section with, Richard Wagner, which I think betrays something insofar as Wagner is really the topic that Nietzsche wanted to write about for at least some of this work. It's a topic he always returns to. If you want to know more about that and you haven't heard it, heard about it, you can go uh, listen to the two-part episode on Richard Wagner, which if you haven't heard that and you haven't read about the relationship or studied it, some of this may be opaque to you. But I think given all that we talked about, I mean, what Nietzsche is talking about in this passage, this long section where he's describing all of these people, Goethe, Beethoven, Napoleon, Stendhal, Heinrich Hein, Schopenhauer, and he says, I even include Richard Wagner. He then uses the same language where he says all of them collapsed and broke before the Christian cross. That is the same language he uses to describe Wagner, uh, which is included in the case of Wagner. I believe it originally appears in the preface he wrote to Human All to Human, which would have been around the same time, um, that where he says Wagner was simply a helpless romantic. And, I mean, Nietzsche says he applies this to all of these great figures, these great... Uh, I mean, he includes Napoleon in there, but he would he would consider them all really a, a kind of artist, you could say. Um, they're all exceptional people. They're all creative people in their way. And he describes them by, he waxes poetic about these types of people who are, as we discussed last season for Nietzsche, sort of the means and the ends of a culture. They are the, the harvest, they are the fruit, they are the, the fruit, and the, the fruit contains the seeds of the next plant, right? Um, are these great men, these exceptions, these great artists and statesmen and leaders and so on and so forth. But what happens to them, what happens to the later Wagner that he says he is against, that he's coming out against here? They all um, capitulate to asceticism. Um, and why does it happen? Well, in moments of weakness or in their old age. When they no longer have a future ahead of them, when life uh, is, has been condemned by the reality of their own mortality and its rapid approach, or the way that your life simply isn't the vigorous, uh, purely joyous experience that it is during youth when you enter old age and suddenly your body starts to fail you in certain ways or you have pain uh, that doesn't go away or lingers with you in a way that you didn't when you were a youth, right? And all of these ways that life is sort of begins to stack up accusations against it. And it's almost the most natural and inevitable thing in the world when someone in their old age comes to yearn for the other world, comes to have those penitential spasms. And that this is what ultimately happened to Wagner. The criticism of Parsifal at the end is, of course, the criticism that... Um, <laughs> It's it's funny because, again, he's criticized the Germans throughout and sort of used Wagner as a stand-in for the Germans. But here he says the real problem is that it was actually Rome speaking there. Uh, the, the, the voice of the, uh, the Roman psyche or spirit through Christianity, right, is what is speaking through Wagner and Parsifal. And um, why? Well, I mean, that's what infected the Roman soul through Luther and his Bible because that was the only artful thing about the German people were their, was their preaching, right? The only uh, way that they had a talent for rhetoric or for the artfulness of language, for, for seducing and bringing hearts over uh, to, their, to their mode of valuation or, or interpreting the world. And so, of course, Richard Wagner writes the Christian, all too Christian Parsifal uh, during his later period, his period of Christianity and uh, romanticism, of course, occurs when Wagner is in his weaker hours, in old age, when he capitulated to fatherlandishness. That's when he became Reichsdeutsch, when he became a patriot. 
It's not just Wagner. He includes him among all of these figures. Of course, they were great when they were young and had this creative energy and this fire and were dared to be exceptional, to lust after the foreign and the exotic and the self-contradictory, when they were reveled in their virtuosity, when they were fanatics of expression at any price. They sacrificed themselves to the sake of their task more fully than any worker, right? Uh, you know, they, were, they labored harder than anyone could, could imagine laboring for any task, giving up their life's blood to their work. But in the end, um, all of them broke and collapsed before the Christian cross because you spend yourself, you spend your energy, you face the decay and the downfall and the decline of your physical body and your time here in this physical world. And Nietzsche, of course, says, well, who among them would have been profound and original enough for a philosophy of the Antichrist? Well, uh, that's uh, exactly the role that Nietzsche feels he's uh, fulfilling and why he warns us not to uh, partake of any metaphysical comforts, to stave them off, maintain that as a sort of purity for as long as we can uh, elsewhere in his work is why he recommends this. But so, you know, in light of that, we can regard much of this chapter, I think, psychologically, given how Nietzsche begins and ends it with his attempt to understand the psychology of what he's called fatherlandishness. And specifically the riddle that was set before Nietzsche as to how somebody like Wagner becomes Reichsdeutsch, fatherlandish, anti-Semitic, uh, something he plainly regards as a stupidity, how he falls to Christianity. And uh, we could say somewhat poetically, he finds that the answer is the same for an individual as for an entire society, that it is um, once again explicable within this principle of life that he has established, that that is a simply conscious, moralistic, or religious elaboration upon the physiological reality of their weakness, their failing health. This is what creates this fatherlandishness. And so, funnily enough, in this passage where Nietzsche spends all this time analyzing people like the French and the English, and most particularly the Germans, which are his main problem, um, because of course they would be, that uh, ultimately much of it is ends up being a meditation on why self-identification with one's fatherland is such a farce and um, such an, uh, an indication of this weakness. Because again, as he restates it at the beginning of this passage, the um, most unequivocal portents, you know, um, portents are signs of the foretelling that help you foretell the future, right? To a soothsayer, these unequivocal portents. So you're getting an unequivocal message from the future. This is where this is going. Europe wants to become one. So why this resistance, this opposition from the anarchists on one side and the patriots on the other? Where does that come from? And it's very hard to argue against the notion that Nietzsche, therefore, would seem to be saying that Europe becoming one, the dissolution of these old national identifications, that is being on the side of strength and that it is an expression of weakness to cling onto them. And with that, we're done with Chapter 8, Peoples and Fatherlands. Uh, next week, we're going to take on the final chapter of uh, Beyond Good and Evil. I'm very excited because it, this, we're going to get into some of my very favorite aphorisms as well as some very scary aphorisms, which is fitting because we're heading towards a spooky season with Halloween coming up. So uh, with all of that being said, uh, we'll be back next week. I'm sorry that there was no episode last week. Uh, I was coming back from tour with my band and um, I just couldn't get it done. Um, I'm finally done with touring for the year. I still have some, lots of things I'm doing with music that are keeping me busy and in other avenues of my life that are keeping me very busy. But um, I will be able to uh, jump wholeheartedly into the podcast now because we're coming up very quickly on season four. I'm very excited for that as well. But join me next week for the beginning of part nine, What is Noble? Signing off. If you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful, 
you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections. The link is in the description. Or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media. Thank you for your support.